on this week's live stream. Strap on your backpack and learn how to get the most out of Scratch's built-in storage system. And don't miss these deals. Mr. T has added some new items to his upgrade store. Learn how to use math to solve tricky timing problems in Scratch. All this and more coming up on the Chromeworks live stream. Hello everybody, it's Mr. Tomac back again with another live stream for Saturday, August 28th. I have April stuck in my head for some reason, I'm not sure why. Um, so, lots going on this week. I am packing up my bags to head to Stockholm, Sweden next week. Really excited about that. Uh, I'm going to be telling you a little bit more about that in a little bit, but um, it is a complicated thing going traveling overseas right now during COVID. Um, I have, still have to go get a, a last minute COVID test at the drugstore, uh, a fast antigen test or whatever. And um, I have to show up in Sweden within 72 hours of getting this test with this um, certificate in hand saying that I actually don't have COVID. So fingers crossed, or they're just going to turf me away and send me back home again. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a second. Oh, we got a big crew on here today. Let's see who's uh, on with us on Discord. We uh, have, as usual, uh, Funny Animator Jim from upstate New York. Good morning, Jim. How are you? Good morning. So uh, Jim has um, uh, given me an inspiration for one of my um, little uh, items today. Uh, we were working on some live stream coding a little uh, a couple of weeks ago and um, he showed me a really cool trick using the mod command to control the timing in uh, different elements and we're going to learn how to use that to control timing in a next costume so I'm really excited to bring that to you thanks for your help with that Jim um, we're here also with one of my new members Gray Gray Fours two four six eight two I'm just going to call him Gray and I don't remember where you're from Gray can you remind me again um, I'm from Virginia. Oh, from Virginia. Okay. Not too far from Washington, D.C., I guess, eh? Yeah. Yeah, cool, cool. All right. What's new with you? Um, so I've been, like, um, finishing up my Flappy Bird game, just fixing some stuff right oh, now. Excellent. Yeah. I also made a chart editor for my rhythm game. Oh, to like kind of speed things up. Cool. Well, I'd love to show some of your stuff. I haven't had a look at your uh, Flappy Bird game, but maybe if we have some time at the end of the stream, we can show it. Um, I did do a tutorial on Flappy Bird a couple, maybe a year or so ago, and um, but I'd like to see your version. It's uh, definitely w uh, one of the first things that a lot of new video game designers try to put together is a version of Flappy Bird. It's not too tricky, and you can learn some great coding concepts from it. So um, send me the link in um, Ask Mr. T, and um, I'll, uh, I haven't had a look at it yet, as I said. Yeah, but maybe... I just got to fix like, a thing where the pipes kind of overlap and like vanilla scratch because this game was designed to be like put on a website and be like embedded with Fortress. Right. Fortress, the default embedding option, um, does not have sprite fencing. So oh. I designed that in mind. Mm -hmm. But right now I can just like fix it to where, you know. Okay. We'll have to talk a little bit more about sprite fencing because I, I, I have kind of a rough idea what you're talking about, but um, but I don't think most of the members of my audience probably understand what you're referring to here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's something we might want to do a little segment on at some point. Actually, I'm going to write that down and um, and maybe we can talk about it later. Okay. Uh, thanks, Gray. We're also here with Kendra from Rockland, just side of, outside of Ottawa. Good morning, Kendra, if you're there. Good morning. Hi, Kendra. Haven't heard from you in a long time. You've been doing any coding at all? Um, only sometimes, not really. Okay. Well, if you ever make a project, please share it with us. I'm shared all. I'm joined also by Kean from Ottawa. Kean hasn't been very chatty lately, but uh, but uh, do say hello if you want a shout out. Hey, Kean. Nope. Yeah, Kian's having some microphone troubles lately. I uh, keep seeing his microphones uh, on and off on um, 
and uh, but I don't actually hear him saying anything. So um... right now I'm on my main computer, mm -hmm. which has like a much better microphone than my laptop. Right. So well, there should be less static issues. Good. Yeah, you're sounding very clear, Gray. Is the audio sounding good on YouTube? You were you were saying the other day that the um, voices on uh, Discord were too loud. Are I, you... I, uh, I need to check. Yeah, um, let me know what the mix is like. I, I've been tweaking some of the settings, and I think it's a little better now, but I can never tell. I need a producer is what I really need. I need someone sitting there with headphones. I'm trying to... Uh, I'm looking at options to bring this live stream into the real world and have maybe have some students in a classroom um, helping me to produce this show in the future. And uh, so that's one of the things I have planned for the new year. I'm joined also by Deck from London, England. Good morning, Deck. How are you? You Hi. there? Hi, Deck. How are things in England? Good, good. So uh, yeah, I'm. I, I think I'm flying right over England, probably on my way. Uh, I'm, I'm flying to uh, Portugal from um, from Toronto. I'm flying from Ottawa to Toronto to Portugal to Stockholm, Sweden this week. So I think the flight route will probably take me pretty close to you. I'll I'll throw something at your house on the way by. So um, let me tell you guys a little bit about my trip here. I am going to Stockholm with my son Jeffrey. And you guys have probably met Jeffrey, at least some of you have. He's been a guest on my live stream before. Jeffrey's eight, just turned 18 and he is a coding savant. He does some amazing coding and he has been accepted into Future Games in Stockholm. It's the, in 2019 and 2018, it was ranked as the second best game design school in the whole planet. And he's um, really excited to go there. I was looking at, um, at a showreel here of, um, of some of the work being produced at Future Games, and it looks really impressive. So I'm going to be um, taking my camera along, or at least my phone along, and I'll be shooting some video while I'm there. I'm going to show you this facility. I'm really interested, never having gone to game design school myself, um, I'm interested in poking around and um, finding out what the vibe is like at a, at a game design school. I know lots of uh, the kids in my audience uh, have dreams of someday going on and doing exactly what Jeffrey's doing, taking your coding knowledge and uh, turning it into a real career in the profession. It's a difficult thing to do, but if, but uh, I think Jeffrey's a good testament to the fact that if you uh, work long enough at it, you can um, build a career in this profession. Take what you love, uh, if you love video games as much as uh, Jeffrey does, and turn it into a career. So uh, really excited about that. I uh, wanted to show you guys um, some of the work that uh, Jeffrey has been doing that got him into this prestigious school. He's the only 18 year old in this program. He's uh, been talking on Discord to some of the other kids who are part of this program and many of them are in their mid twenties, have already graduated from university. So how does an 18 year old get into a program like this? Well, he did a really great um, um, introductory package that explained everything that, he, that he's been working on, especially highlighting this Project Yeehaw package that he's, uh, game that he's been putting together. It's still not quite ready for publication yet. I don't think I've ever shown you guys the trailer for it, but today sounds like a really good opportunity to do that. So this is the, tr um, so, so what I'm going to show you now is the trailer for the unfinished game called Project Yeehaw that Jeffrey has put together. It's a supernatural cowboy shooter and he's built it in Unity, the, the Unity game engine. Now he uh, he taught himself all the, uh, the code, not just the coding, but the th uh, 3D animation and inverse kinematics and all kinds of other um, very complicated texturing and lighting and just all the different elements. So he was the, um, well, he has imported some assets for this game, but he's done quite a bit of the graphic works himself. And he set this game, it's a cowboy game, but it's set in hell and it has supernatural aspects to it. I'm going to show you guys the trailer to it right now. I'm really proud of my boy and I want to show you what he's done. So this trailer he put together himself as well. We haven't, I don't think he's licensed the music for it yet. He is going to approach the band in the future um, that's put the song together. But for now, uh, one of the reasons he hasn't published this on YouTube yet is that he doesn't quite have the um, the licensing all underway to to do this, but uh, I'm going to uh, jump the gun here and show you guys a little bit of his game, Project Yeehaw. Here we go.
Very, very cool. Anyway, so um, as I said, uh, Jeffrey did use assets to put that together, but um, but uh, many of the graphic effects and the lighting and the sky boxes and the smoke trails coming off of the, the guns and so many of the other little details um, that are, are in this game were all designed by him. This has been Jeffrey's kind of COVID project when everyone got kicked out of school at the um, beginning of, uh, of, the, of 2020 um, and was stuck at home, most of you guys just playing video games. Jeffrey started working almost full time putting this game together. He's done a fantastic job. Have I shown this to you guys yet? Anyone on the live stream? Have you seen this trailer before? Or this is the first time that I've, um, that I've aired it here, I think, okay? I thought that I saw that um, Jeffrey showed his game in the voice chat, but I didn't see the trailer, and that looked amazing. Yeah, he's done some fantastic work, anyway. I heard the music on YouTube, yeah. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Live stream. Yeah, it's a fairly uh, famous song. Jeffrey's really into dark country music, and I forget the name of this particular band, but it uh, seemed to go really nicely with the uh, with the game. Anyway, really excited about that. So uh, I'm off to Stockholm, Sweden with Jeffrey this week, and we're going to be looking for an apartment there for him and getting him all set up for this two-year uh, sort of post-grad program that he's going to be uh, jo joining at this uh at this organization called Future Games, which uh, I'm really excited about. So um, that is about it for that. Oh, I got some screen issues here. Whoa! Okay, that's looking better. All right, so let's get on to the actual Scratch stuff today. I got a couple of things I wanted to show you. Number one, um, I wanted to show you the uh, part, the third and final part of my upgrade store series here. Let's get to that right now. All right, so this is the finished upgrade system um, project. I've shown it to you the last couple of weeks in a row. I'm just pasting the link into the text chat if you guys are interested in uh, calling it up and having a look at it. So really what I've been doing uh, in the first week, we set up the actual store. And what I've been doing in the last couple of weeks is just adding flesh to the game. And so um, I'm gonna have to go in and hack some money here because right now we get zero income and I won't be able to buy anything, of course. So let's let's set my credits to um, maybe 200,000. And let's give this a try now. All right, so we've got enemies coming up the top of the screen. As you can see, we can upgrade. Um, I've already shown you the lasers, which we did the last week. This week I added a, um, a shield system. And you can see the shield kind of slowly charges itself up. And you can use it to bash into enemies. And that makes it weak and more transparent again. And then it gets stronger. And there's two levels of shield. And you can see when your shields are out, if you get hit again before they recharge, then you get killed. There's also a uh, la uh, missile launcher system here. This is an area effect weapon. So um, once it's charged up, you hit the Z key and then the missile launches. And if, um, if any of the enemies are inside the area of the blast here, they get destroyed as well. The second upgrade for the missile uh, is the Annihilation Class Launcher, which is banned under Section 232 of the Galactic Convention on Space Warfare. It is nasty. So it actually destroys everything on the whole screen, you can see here. There you go, and it just nukes everything on the entire screen. Um, so the game's more or less done. It needs some play balancing. I'm not sure if it's really the... Um, if it's, if it's really challenging enough right now, especially once you do buy all the upgrades. And I, I'm not sure if I priced all the upgrades properly. This kind of stuff turns out to be very, very tricky to, to turn into a fun and engaging game. You want uh, to string your players along and get them playing the game, wanting to be able to afford those upgrades. If you make it take too long, they get frustrated and they leave. And if you give them, if you give them the updates, the upgrades too soon, then the game's overpowered and they get bored of it and move on. So finding that balance is really quite tricky. Um, so a couple of different things I did in the coding that I wanted to show you guys. Over here in the upgrades, I want to show you the code that I used for the, um, for the shields here. So um, what I've done is I've set my ghost effect to match my shield energy times minus one. And so what happens then is when my shield energy is 100, 
um, my ghost effect ends up being um, minus 100, which is basically the same as zero. So, so my, uh, hold it, when my shield energy is 100, then my ghost effect is, yeah, is minus 100, which is basically zero, which means it's fully visible. And then as you, you take damage to your shield energy, it gets more and more transparent until finally it gets your shield energy is down to zero, in which case your ghost effect will be 100. Now this minus 100 here is, is for um, the second costume, the, uh, the, the more intense shield, the thicker one here. I wanted that one to be 200 in strength. And so what the minus 100 does here is it basically ignores um, if your shield energy is anything between 100 and 200 and you subtract 100 from it, it'll basically still be 100. And then once you reach 100, it'll start to fade away. So this shield won't even start to disappear until you've taken probably a couple of hits from your bad guys. Um, the uh, killing all the clones on the screen, I just did with a touching white screen. I just created a white screen here. And uh, when it receives a message here that says to destroy everything, it just flashes this on the screen and then checks to see if any of the bad guys are touching this white screen and they get nuked. And so um, that's just a nice little uh, trick that I used. You could um, also destroy your guys just by saying, when I, uh, when I receive this message, uh, delete all clones, of course, because when I receive a message works the same as a when I start as a clone message, um, though it does work on, on ordinary objects as well as clones, so that's something you have to be careful about. Anyway, so um, that is it for this game. The, um, so I, I'm not gonna do any more work on it. As I said, I don't think it's a perfect game. I would love it if you guys would wanna remix it for me and uh, tweak things a little bit. It's so easy to add upgrades to this game. Just go into the graphics and uh, you can tweak around any of these different graphics and come up with your own cool custom spaceship. And um, definitely it's, it's not too difficult to uh, invent your own kind of upgrades as well. I'm not quite sure what else I would want to add to this game, but there's uh, lots you can do with that. So um, please do have a look and uh, play the game. And uh, I would love to see you guys remix it. There is a remix room set up for it. And um, if you want to save your remix there, I will show it on my stream. We haven't had a lot of people remixing my games lately. And that makes Mr. T sad. All right, so um, I, our main uh, topic today was backpacks. And I know this is a little bit simple for some of you guys who um, are fairly advanced with Scratch, and that includes most of my viewers here, but I did wanna do a beginner level lesson that shows some of the benefits of using a backpack. So um, when I think of the backpack, I would think of Dora the Explorer. Do you guys remember that from Dora the Explorer? Who, who's, who's watched Dora as a kid? I had a toddler in the house, of course, back when Dora was really popular. Do you guys still watch Dora? Is it still a thing? Yeah, I used to watch, watch it, it like, all, all the time, time when I was, I was like, like four. four. Right. Is it still on or? I don't, I don't know. know. I haven't checked. checked. Yeah. Anyway, so um, the backpack was something that Dora took around with her everywhere that you went. And it was kind of bottomless and it always had the exact thing that uh, Dora needed to, to uh, accomplish her mission. And uh, the backpack and scratches can be very much the same kind of thing. Let's uh, get over to my screen here and uh, show you some scratch. So um, the backpack, a lot of noob users um, don't even know it exists because it's tucked away at the bottom of the screen here. You can't even see it here because of all the uh, stuff I've got going on in the bottom of the screen here. Let me try and hide some of this. Whoa, um, my bottom bar here, there we go. And then the text, today's lesson, gotta hide a few things. There we go. And so the backpack's hidden right down here at the bottom of the screen here. 
and it's just a little gray bar, but when you click on it, it opens it up. If you are not logged in, you will not see the backpack. So lots of people who just play around in Scratch and don't have a user account are not gonna be able to take advantage of this. Um, so the backpack has all sorts of uses, but mostly it's a repository for storing anything you wanna keep. So if you have a custom sprite or something, for example, I've got this Commander Cody here that I grabbed from another Scratch user. So if you wanna bring it in, you drag it onto the stage. And, oh, not, not onto the stage, sorry, right into the sprite drawer. I got that wrong. And there you can see Commander Cody's in there now. Any code that is attached to him will also be saved here. So Commander Cody has a little bit of an animation thing going here. What, is he hidden? Yeah, he's hidden here. So um, let's see what he does. Not very much. Uh, there's a little animation cycle here, but I'm not quite sure why he's hiding. Let's just get rid of that hide there and see what Commander Cody does. So, um, so the idea is you can bring in sprites, costumes, you can bring in bits of code, and you can uh, bring in sound effects too. You can take uh, any sound effect from the game and drag it. Oh, I'm not, I'm into sprites here again, sorry. So let's load up a sound effect, like alert here. So even an MP3 sound or something that you grab from elsewhere, you can just grab it from here, drag it into your backpack. And there it is. And so it says sound alert. Now the labeling system for the things is, uh, is reasonably good. If your sprite has a name, for example, it will uh, attach that name to it. Here's a scratch cat sprite that I've been saving for, for a while. And it just has a whole bunch of different scratch cat animations that are different from the regular ones in it. You can see, oh no, this one's just a, uh, this is one I grabbed from the scratch team. It's just scratch doing a little dance, I forgot. Anyway, so uh, I use uh, these uh, backpack uh, entries for a whole bunch of stuff, but mostly I like to use them as a code repository. So um, if I've gone ahead and created custom blocks like the ones that I showed you last week, you can store them all inside a single sprite. So here's an example. Here is um, the useful scripts package that I showed you guys last week. And you, see, you can see there's a whole bunch of custom code in here. And so I've got all of these custom blocks all set up here and ready to go. And I just have to drag the single item out of my backpack and then figure out what I'm gonna do. If I wanted to use any of these custom blocks, I'd have to bring them over to the sprite I was gonna use them in. So I just from here, drag them over to Scratch Cat or whatever, and then I could use the code here that way. So you can get stuff out of the backpack, particularly code. You can drag it into the backpack by dragging it here. And when you drag it out again, um, it does some unusual things. It, it often pops into the wrong location or place where it's a little bit tricky to figure out. So there's a fixed location here inside Scratch. It's kind of the zero, zero coordinate point. As you're building code, you get farther and farther away from that point. It lets you drag basically across an infinite palette here. And so once I start getting to a very complex bit of code and then try to drag something out of the backpack back into the area here, it will look like it did not appear. And the reason for that is because it always drops it back in that origin point, that zero, zero spot in the middle of the screen here. So you can see that it actually landed right on top of the first one that I dragged over. So do, um, if you're working on a big project, do be aware that it's always going to show up in the same area. It doesn't matter where you drag an object into on the screen, it's always going to show up in exactly the same spot. So something to uh, pay attention to. Now, as I said, the naming system is not too bad for these things. You can see the name of whatever the sprite was that you dragged in. The only exception to that is your code. When I, this piece of code here that I dragged in, it just says code. And I find that really frustrating. Um, so I'm really excited this week, uh, one of my favorite Scratch add-on um, programs, the Chrome add-on called Scratch add-on, strangely enough, they released an upgrade this week. You can find this on the Chrome Web Store, by the way. And um, if uh, and just this week, they released an upgrade that has a new feature here that says name scripts before placing in backpack. I'm gonna switch that on just by clicking it this way. And now when I drag a piece of code over into my library here, it actually is gonna prompt me 
with to, with the name of the code here. So I'm going to say um, some script and then go OK. And so I've given the project a name. And now down here, instead of just saying code, it actually has the name that I gave it. So a really handy little thing. I uh, have had a lot of difficulty organizing my uh, backpack uh, over time. I just get so many entries in here. And with code, it's just difficult to figure out what it is that you've saved here. There are great pieces of code that you do want to put in your backpack. One of the ones that I use all the time, for example, is a movement um, um, algorithm here. So when I, um, whenever I start a new game that just has keyboard controls, I'm always entering the exact same code every time. So rather than reinventing the wheel every time, I can take those 16 or 20 blocks that I use in almost every um, top-down movement game that I or um, platformer and just drag it all into. Um, in, uh, out of my backpack, and then I can save myself a lot of trouble coding. You can do the same thing for um, for code for like a platformer, for example. There's a lot of good platform engines, and you can just save that one little bit of code that you need. Or if there's more than one piece of code, just save the sprite, right? Because the sprite always contains the code that's inside it. So uh, basically, I would just get one character ready to go inside of a platformer game or whatever, a generic one, and then drag it into the backpack. And then as I'm making future platformer games or teaching other people how to do it, I can always drag that back out again. All right. I don't see anyone in the YouTube chat today. So if you are on YouTube and uh, you want to say hi, uh, by all means, leave me a little text message here, and I'll give you a uh, shout out on the stream. So uh, backpacks are really handy for a bunch of stuff that you wouldn't really think. And the number one um, area I like to use it in is um, moving stuff back and forth between different versions of a project. Sometimes I'm fiddling around with a project and I want to kind of do a save as and then um, and not destroy it of what I've done when I want to try something new. So I'm often moving stuff back and forth between two different tabs in Scratch. In this case here, for example, if I had uh, if I was working on the Commander Cody sprite and I wanted to bring it into a different project, I could just drag it into my um, backpack, then surf over to a different Scratch tab here, and then open my backpack up again. You'll see it'll upgrade, update itself with the graphic that I shoved in there, and I can drag that back into my sprite drawer again. I don't want to do it. I don't want to ruin my upgrade system game. While I'm at it here, I actually want to uh, bring these credits down to zero so I don't end up hacking my own game. All right. Anyway, so that's one useful thing you can do. But I, I think an even more useful technique you can use for this is for um, working collaboratively with other people. So I wouldn't suggest you do this. You should never give away your main Scratch account's user ID information, of course. Your account is your private business. But um, I do, every once in a while, when I'm collaborating with other kids, share out kind of a burner Scratch account. I create a secondary account that I'm really not concerned about. And then I'll share that login information with uh, one of my friends or somebody else who I'm doing coding with. We both log in under the same um, username. And then um, at, at, we'll both be coding the same project simultaneously. And if one of us makes some progress and the other one um, hasn't quite caught up to that, they can save the object into their backpack and then you can drag it out. I know um, one of the things a lot of new Scratch users have asked me about in the past when I've been teaching this in the classroom is whether there is the ability to collaborate kind of like Google Docs where everyone can be coding simultaneously. And that is not a feature in Scratch. I don't know if it ever will be. It would be a fantastic little way to do collaboration, to have multiple people dragging blocks onto the screen and playing around with code. But I don't know if that's ever going to happen inside actual Scratch. So um, this is one workaround that you can use to collaborate with other students and do some um, some work where where you're both coding at the same time and then one of you sharing it with the other and then you carry on coding. Uh, now the only thing to be cautious about is when you're both working on the same scratch file at once, whoever the last person was who saved the file, their version of it will get saved basically. So um, once you shut down the project, whoever the last person is to save will end up um, saving their version of it. So um, 
you're going to only want to do this with someone you trust, obviously, who uh, who's not going to mess up uh, your hard work on this. But if you're into collaborating, I think this would be a really cool idea. Has anyone ever done that kind of a collaboration before? Anyone in my Discord? I, this will work, right? I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, I, but I did it over Discord, not with, with like separate accounts, just like, you know, sharing, like basically uploading assets back and forth. Yeah, but what do you do with code, just, though, Gray? We basically, you know, just export the sprites and then, like, upload the sprite files. Yeah, and the sprite files contain all the code, right? I just think yeah. this, yeah. I, well, this board has, like, a problem where if you don't have Nitro, the limit is only up to, like, 7 megabytes or 8. So I yeah. usually do not include like any sounds right when i'm like you know uploading those i just add those later so even discord which is a really really useful tool for uh for sharing and collaborating it has some limits right because of the file sizes are are quite tiny in here so you're right about that gray um so that's a one area where i think this backpack technique might work really well I'm uh, definitely going to try it on some of my live coding projects in the future. I've done some limited stuff in the classroom uh, with this where um, where I'm working on files and other people are working on um, within the same account as well. Or um, just, just looking at my file and then refreshing the screen every once in a while. And that's something that we were doing on the live stream for quite a while as well. Anyway, so um, that is uh, really all I wanted to say about um, about backpacks. I just have my notes here. Um, yeah, I think. Do you have? Do you know if um, there's a maximum amount of data that you can put inside a single uh, sprite or uh, for, to fit in the backpack? Because sometimes when I want to backpack um, really long songs, mm -hmm. um, it gives me an error. Well, scratch. And, uh, had to mess around with um, cropping the sound so it fits, and sometimes there is an actual, there is um, a definitive number. Like if I would have the song be 174 seconds versus 176 seconds, it would fit in the backpack or not. Yeah, so, that... uh, here's a thing I want to cover about like audio optimization. Mm -hmm. So here's a quick tip: if you want to edit audio, do not do it. Like, if you want your product to be, like, really small, uh -huh. edit it in, like, a software, like, Audacity. Yeah. And, like, export it to an MP3. Because if you backpack sounds in Scratch, most of the time, it will just convert it to a WAV file. And, like, if you edit something, even, like, a tiny bit of the file in the built-in Scratch audio, it will convert it to a WAV file. And if that song is really long, sometimes it just won't, like, backpack. Oh, so if you leave it in the native MP3 format without um, without editing it, then it will stay small, and then you'll be able to backpack it. Yeah. Very cool, Gray. That's actually a handy piece of information. I have had so many audio issues in some of my big projects, like um, my RPG Maker engine that I published last year, for example. I constantly had this problem where the file was saving and, and um, or where I loaded the file up and it just was stuck on the saving screen. It just said saving, 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 and the file never actually got saved. I'd refresh, reload the project, and then the next time I tried to save it, again, it wouldn't save. And so those new changes never did take. And after a lot of playing around, I started deleting audio files, and boom, that's exactly what happened. Uh, as soon as I uh, deleted yeah, one. That happened to me too. Yeah. So big audio files. I wonder if anyone um, can tell me whether there's an actual limit. Maybe there's something on the Scratch wiki. Oh, um, yeah. There is a limit on like assets in general. Mm -hmm. um, it is like 10 megabytes per asset. And like, like not price, price, but like, you know, per file, like audio. Yeah. And, like, the images and stuff. But is there a limit on the number of assets? So 10 megabytes multiplied by 100 different assets? Like, can you have uh, a gigantic file that has 100 different 10 megabyte objects? Or is there an, a fixed limit per scratch file? If anyone it knows, is, sorry, great. The, the SP3 file, file, there's a theoretical, like, like unlimited limit. limit. Unlike in 2.0, uh -huh. where, yeah, yeah basically, basically I saw a 300 megabyte of SP3 file once. 300 megabytes? And like, um, let's see, uh, 
So, so basically, basically yeah, yeah, as long as, as like, like your each sound file and like image and other things, and, things, and the, the code, code, as long as it's under 10 megabytes, um, it's, it's theoretically um, unlimited to the SB3 size. Okay, I just Googled this. So um, it says here in Scratch 3.0, all assets must be under 10 megabytes and the project's um, JavaScript, for Java file, must be under Jason. 5 megabytes. So there's, but there's no limit on the file size. Oh. Yeah. Okay. The explicit limit. Yeah, it can be gigabytes in size. So the explicit limit yeah. is 318 gigabytes. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's like bigger than like triple in games so yeah. yeah i don't think you would be able to like reach that 318 gigabyte limit just to wow. be honest like yeah and also it's gonna it's pretty rare to reach the project json file limit yeah so and if you do there's like a a project on scratch that allows you to compress the project json so basically you just rename the sb3 to zip Right. And then you replace the project JSON in the zip, then rename it back to SB3 and yeah. Interesting. So uh, so the the JSON file is the Java file, right? Of the actual code saved uh, in Java, is that correct? It has like the, basically a JSON file. It isn't like, you know, an explicit like programming language. It's kind of like a descriptor like, yes. for example, it basically just tells where, like, all the code is and stuff. Okay. Um, stuff. So it's like a package yeah. that contains all of the assets and the it's code. It's kind of like a container yeah. for, like, the code and stuff. Okay, but I believe that JSON is related to Java, right? Let me look that up. JSON, JavaScript Object Notation, a lightweight yeah. data interchange format. Okay. So that's what uh, JSON is. It's just a format for uh, for sharing data between different programs. And so this is the um, yeah. this is the preferred format that the Scratch team has developed for Scratch. So underneath um, their Scratch I engine, think Honkin uses JSON files to store the charting songs. Okay. So yeah, it can be used in theoretically any application. Okay. Well, thanks for that little bit of insight there, Gray. Um, all right, I did have one more thing I wanted to cover today, so I think I'm going to leave it at that for backpacks. Um, I did want to talk to you guys a little bit about um, timing problems inside Scratch projects. So I've got a little project here. Here it is. It's called Next Costume Timing. I'm going to share the link here if you're interested. And I'll pop that into the YouTube as well here. So um, this is... Um, just uh, uh, having taught a lot of beginner students, I know this is something that's uh, in high demand among people who are um, fairly new to Scratch here. So um, let me show you what's going on here. So uh, I've got two cats on the screen here. I've got uh, the top cat A and the middle cat B. You can see that cat, when I hit the A button, the cat is just walking across the screen. It's a very, very simple script here. Um, he's moving five steps, bouncing, and changing his costume. So this is one of the first things that I teach kids to do when we're developing our own video games. And what the question I invariably get is, how do I slow his feet down? His feet are just running around like crazy here, and it doesn't look very realistic, right? So um, the first thing most students try is to add a delay. So let me show you here. We've got the same code here, but now we're doing a wait one second in between. And so you're, you'd think that, that would fix the uh, problem with the um, timing, but it creates a new timing problem, right? So now in between every movement, it's also um, waiting one second. So we have to decouple the movement from the costume change in order for this to work. The simple way to do it is to take the costume change part and the delay here, put it into its own bit of code here. And so now when I press the B key, both of these things are running in parallel to each other. And I can change this delay to whatever I want. So 0 0.2 is probably a pretty good delay for these kind of animations. You can see that the second animation is looking a lot more smooth here. 
Um, now, the problem we were having when I was live coding with funny animator Jim a couple of weeks ago is we wanted, we didn't want to have a second stream of code for this stuff. We wanted it all contained inside the same if statement um, because our code was getting incredibly complicated and we were trying to keep everything embedded inside the same line of, uh, uh, the same block of code. And so the method that Jim showed me and um, kudos for coming up with this is using the mod command. I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the mod command before I show you the example of how this is going to work. Um, there's a banana sprite here that I've set up. Let me hide these first two guys here. So I've created a simple script here um, that kind of shows off what the mod command does. Let's go over to the banana. Um, so what this code does is it just creates a banana in the middle of the screen and then when the clone is created, it moves it off in a random direction. So every second, a banana gets spawned and moves off the screen in a random direction. So um, this is kind of the situation we had when I was coding with Jim a few weeks ago, which is what if every once in a while you want a different banana to show up? I've got a second costume here that's brown bananas, right? So I want maybe every three or four bananas to be a brown one instead of a white one. How do I go about doing that inside my code? Um, and so you could do it with an if statement and pick a random number or whatever about that, but what if you want it regularly, you'd have to do some kind of a loop inside your main loop and uh, use variables to keep track of it, and it would just get a little bit complicated. So this mod command is really, really useful for that. You guys will remember the mod command basically takes any number, and when you mod a number, if I mod a number, uh, Oh, I've got someone uh, logged in here named Professor Scratch. Hi, Mr. T. I would love a shout out, please. I'm Hen uh, Harry, age 12, from England and a very keen scratchers. You do great work, a big fan. Well, hi, Harry. Thank you very much for, uh, for the kind words. We have quite a few users in England, including my friend Deck here. So, um, fantastic. Send us a link to one of your projects and I'll show it on the stream, buddy. Send me something that you're really proud of. All right, back to um, the mod command here. So this is an advanced math function that basically takes any number and um, it and um, what it does is um, it rounds it off and takes the remainder of that number and shows it to you. In, now, the math isn't really as important as the fact that if you take any number and run it through a mod, it will... Um, it will create a number between zero and the number here. So in this case, between zero and two, actually one less than this. So it'll, so if you pump any number into here, so for example, if I go type a five into here, for example, it won't output a five, it'll output a zero, a one, or a two. So if I do mod on this, you can see that it could give me a two. If I go to the next number, it'll go back down to zero again. And then the next number up, seven, it'll go to one. And then eight, it will give me a two. And then nine will give me a zero again. So it'll, so the answer will always be zero. And then the next one up will be um, one. And then the next one up will be two. And if I go with, uh, with a bigger number here, then, then it'll count up that number uh, from zero through whatever that the one less than that highest number is because it's on, because it starts on zero, it's always going to go to one less than that number. Now, how is that useful? It's great for doing any kind of a loop where you want something happening every once in a while. Let me show you how we would construct this to have the banana come up. Let's say I wanted one in every three bananas to come up as a brown. So before I create a clone of myself, I'm gonna put an if statement in here, just like that. And I'm gonna say if, now I've got a, uh, a variable, we, you do need a variable in here that changes. I created a variable called counter, it's just a global variable. And we're just gonna set it to zero at the beginning and then change it by one every time. So every time this counter changes, we're gonna mod that number and it's gonna come up with an output number that's between zero and our mod number. So if I put counter into this equal, so if counter is equal, oh sorry, uh, so mod, we gotta put the mod into there first. Let me go grab my mod. So if counter mod three 
is equal to zero, we'll leave zero on the right hand side there because zero is the only number that's always going to show up no matter what we put into the right hand number here. So if the count, so it's always going to spit out zero, one, or two with this. And so if it spits out zero once in every third time, then we're going to activate the brown banana. I'm going to switch to brown banana. It's going to create a clone that's brown. And then when it comes back around the loop here again, it's going to switch um, the next for the next clone. It's going to switch back to the default banana. So it's only going to give me a brown banana once in every three bananas. Let's run the code here and see how that works. So there's my brown banana for zero, then one, two, and then another brown one. And so if I want to change that timing, I can go into here and change this number. So if I change this to six, for example, now my first banana will be brown, and then we will get four yellow ones. One, two, three, four, and then another, oh, five, sorry, five, and then a brown one again. Yeah, so five yellow ones and then one brown one. So the total number of bananas is always going to be the number to the right of the mod here, basically. So six bananas, five of them yellow, and only one of them brown, because that's the one that uh, corresponds to zero here. Okay, so how do we use this to fix the movement problem I was showing you guys earlier? Let's go have a look inside our um, third cat object here, uh, object C. And... Um, so we're going to use something similar in here. We've got the code here. When I hit the letter C, let's make this guy show up. I've got some default code in here that's making my cat move around here. And I could add that next costume code, but I'm going to put the next costume code inside of an if statement, the same way I did with the bananas here. So let's reconstruct this a little bit. We're going to change that counter variable right in here we're going to change counter oh it has to be inside a loop sorry so we're going to put that inside the loop when i hit the letter c we're going to change that counter by one every time and then we're going to add an if statement here so let's go ahead and grab an if statement whoops and i'm going to say if counter mod 5 is equal to zero. So again, we're looking for once every certain number of increments, right? So what I'm trying to do here is I'm gonna put a next costume inside here. Are you guys starting to see my logic here? So I'm gonna to go to my looks menu. I'm gonna grab a next costume. When is this costume going to run? It's only, the costume change is only gonna run once in every five frames that I'm running here. And, um, and so using that, we can control the speed of the costume change without leaving our loop and going off to a second stream of the program. Let me hit the C key here and you can see this in action. So there's my cat running around using the mod command. Now when I change the mod number, I can change his speed. So let's go ahead and try something uh, faster. I'll put a two in there. And you can see that immediately the cat speed goes up. And um, if we go to a bigger number, like 10 or something, for example, then my cat's, whoa, I don't want to do that. We're going to have the letter C here. There we go. You can see that it slows down quite a bit. Or I could do an even slower number there, like 20. There you go. Now the last thing I wanted to show you guys, so this is a really cool little feature and I wanted to show you how you can put this into a custom block. So if you wanted to have an advanced next costume block that actually had a delay in it, let me show you how I go about creating that right now. So I'm gonna go create a brand new block. I'm gonna go over to my, my blocks here over at the bottom left and I'm gonna go make a new block. I don't need to run without screen refresh. We're just gonna use the default options here but I am gonna add a, um, a uh, input here as well, a place where you can add a number to this. So I'm going to type in next costume with delay. Now I want right next to this to be a little bubble where I can type in the number of the, of the delay that I want, which is basically going to be that mod characteristic that we're going to add to it. So I'm going to I'm going to click on add an input, and that's going to create a um, little kind of internal variable here that the um, that the custom block can use. I'm going to type in what I want that kind of variable to be called and it's just going to be delay. There we go. 
So now when I click OK, I've got a new custom block. And you can see the block that I can use here is next costume with delay and I can put any number I want in there. Now if I type a 10 here, how did that number get into the project? Well, we have to put that into the definition here. So let's go ahead and define this. I'm going to take this entire function here, uh, if counter uh, mod, yeah, I'm just going to drag all of this stuff here with the next costume into the defined function here. And now um, I need to figure out what uh, to, to, to change this mod number here so that it's a variable. I want it to match up with this number here. How do we do that? We just take that word delay that I used inside my custom block here. We drag it into the spot where you want that variable to be affected. So I want to be able to change that mod number. I'm going to drag delay into there. And now whatever number I fit into this block here is going to be reflected in this spot here. So if I did want a 20, for example, just like it is in there by default, I can plop that in there. And now I have a new next costume block that I can use wherever I want it to. So let's try running that now. We'll hit the letter C here. So there's my delay of 20, and I can change that to 10. Or if I want it running really fast, I can make it go to one or three. And so I have a, a neat new custom uh, block here that does all that next costume work for me. Now, now you do, it's more complicated than it probably needs to be. And, it, and in most cases, it won't be that useful. Like what I did here, putting uh, the code into two different streams is usually the most efficient way to do it. But if you're doing a bunch of this kind of work and you're just trying to make your code a little bit more elegant, then that is a way to do it. Anyway, I, it's almost 11 o'clock, so I think we're uh, getting ready to wrap it up today. Oh, I was going to show um, Gray's, um, uh, we have a couple of minutes. Gray, Gray did you want to send me I your button? In, in show and tell. tell. In show and tell. Okay, let me see if I can find it there. Uh, there we go. All right, so this is Gray's Flappy Bird file. Let's uh, have a look at it right now. Flappy Bird remake. And this is all your own code? Gray? Oh, nice. I like the uh, the tool tip at the beginning. Oh, yeah, it's a rage game, all right. Oh, really nice. So you've actually got a lot of the elements of the original game in here. This is uh, more elaborate than the version that I did. Whoop. Oh, nice. Well. Very good, Greg. Nice work. What did you what What did you say you weren't happy about? Oh, I fixed it. Okay, so it's good now. And right? I used like the bug was like you know it would kind of overlap because it was designed for fourth wrist, which is an have sprite fencing. Right. But I fixed it out, and I'm probably gonna share it to my cat to make a couple improvements to it, like adding a pause button, like the actual game right right but yeah it's like as accurate as possible this is this is looking really pretty dead on to uh to the version that i've played i'm going to share the address with you guys in the chat if you're interested in playing gray's i will share a new address um in a moment because that's when that's going to be on my main account okay this is your alt account as i can see yeah here. yeah okay so um all right, yeah, if you can share that with us, I'd um, love to let our readers know. Uh, Dex typing something. So I, I thought it was a, quite a nice version. Deck, I know you've made a Flappy Bird game before as well. To make it better, maybe you can change the position of the tubes at the start. That's Oh, it. yeah. Yeah, let me have a look at that. I'm not sure what. So, what is it? What is it? What does Deck mean by that? Like, it seems like they uh, they start off screen at the beginning and then they start moving. Um, in the real Flappy Bird game, I know that they're not. There's not as many of them, right? It seems like your your number of tubes is a little high. Yeah. Whoa, this is frustrating. Anyway, uh, I do think I in the original Flappy Bird game as well, the distance between the pipes isn't random as well, right? It, it gets narrower as the game progresses, or I haven't played a ton of Flappy Bird, so I couldn't tell you for sure. Does anyone know the answer to that question? No? I used to think it was just randomly generated. It could, was just, it could just be random, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I'm not sure. It, it might actually just be random. Um, it does look like your pipes are a little bit close together as well, eh, compared to the original um, Flappy Bird. Yeah, I added like a timing tick in Italy that timing tick reaches like 27 mm -hmm. or 26. Um, it will create a two. Mm -hmm. And I was going to add delta timing, but the physics were not being nice with that, so. Right. Delta, delta timing being uh, setting up timing so that um, when... Like, for example, if your frame rate gets higher, it stays at the same speed. Yeah, yeah. So this is an yeah, this is an important concept in gaming um, because different people are playing games at different frame rates, and if you want the game to always run at the same speed, no matter who's playing it, you need to use delta time rather than time. I have a script of that in the backdrops. Mm-hmm. So in the backdrop, it's really how that works. Is it it broadcasts? A delta time script, and when they when it receives a delta time script, it, yeah. reset, it resets the timer. Okay, and where is the delta time script? The actual script. Um, it's not in there, but I can explain how it kind of works. So basically, I do like change, for example, change x by um, timer times, for example, twenty five. Okay, and um, now. The thing is, Scratch is generally locked to a, uh, to a frame rate unless you're in um, turbo mode, right? So most, right. Pe most people aren't going to be affected by um, delta time issues when they're working. Unless if their computer is like a little slower and has trouble kind of like running the project. Yeah, I think a lot of my um, viewers who are new to Scratch don't really understand how frame rates work in Scratch, but Scratch is locked to a certain frame rate. I believe it's 30 frames a second, right? There's uh, a feature in Scratch Alice. It, like, if you press like Alt and like click the green flag, it can set it to 60 FPS, but in most cases out of 10, people are just gonna be running at 30 frames a second. So. Yeah, exactly. But it's still important. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's what turbo mode is about. So turbo mode will uh, make a game run at whatever the max frame rate is that your computer is able to handle. And so that's where a function like the delta time would go. There's some very complex projects, especially 3D ones, that can only run in turbo mode because they're just way too um, slow. I wish there was a code command that would actually flip you into turbo mode, but there doesn't appear to be. Um... And so uh, Dex asking, is that how turbo warp works? Well, turbo warp also recompiles. So turbo warp, for those of you who don't know, is a um, website that will run Scratch files externally outside of Scratch and generally runs them a lot faster than Scratch does. So yeah, that's one of the things that Turbo Warp does is it unlocks the frame rate so that it'll run at whatever speed your computer is. But it'll also recompile the um, the game into JavaScript, I think. Yeah, JavaScript. Yeah, JavaScript, which also makes it run faster. So if you're running any kind of a complex um, Scratch project that, um, that Scratch is really being a hog with, and if even Turbo Warp doesn't work, uh, then, or sorry, if even turbo mode doesn't work, then you can go over the Turbo Warp website and run it that way. Really fantastic website for advanced Scratch developers. So if you're looking for uh, for like the cutting edge of Scratch, you're going to find a lot of that on the Turbo Warp website. Uh, I've been we've done a feature on it before as well, and I think it's a really cool little feature. Um, okay, well, it's 11 o'clock. I think I'm going to cut it loose here. I'm going to stick around in Discord for another couple of minutes if anyone wants to chat. But um, in the meantime, I um, am just going to remind you guys that I've released part three of uh, my Upgrade Store tutorial. It should be out right now, this very moment. I haven't added the caption information. I'm going to do a little bit of that as soon as I get offline here. But um, really excited about that. It's going to be a few more weeks before I'm back, guys. I'm going to be off in Sweden, and I really don't know when it's going to be back. I'm going to post um, um, an update, and as always, my website will have um, my comings and goings. So next live stream, you will definitely hear about it if you're subscribed to my various uh, channels, especially my YouTube channel, where if you subscribe and ring the bell, you will get a notification when my next live stream is coming up. Okay, guys, this was a lot of fun. I'm going to... Yeah. What's that, Gray? 
Sorry. Anyway, I'm going to uh, log off now. I'm, uh, I will be compiling some film while I'm in Sweden, so you can look forward to seeing some uh, home movies from Sweden when I get back here. Hopefully some stuff from uh, future games, so uh, looking forward to that. In the meantime, happy coding.